thank you for being here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I'm Janara Nirenberg. I'm going to just briefly introduce the Neurodiversity Project and our incredible speaker. So the Neurodiversity Project started um, as a way to really support the neurodivergent community. So those of us who identify as ADHD, autistic, HSP, synesthetic, and various other neurotypes. And we started to do these author events, which have been a great addition. And we actually have some conferences and retreats coming up, so please check those out on Facebook and Twitter, and feel free to reach out if you want to get involved. And, sorry, I'm like so hot right now. Are you guys okay? <laughs> 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 We're having this like, heat wave in San Francisco. <laughs> so, um, a little bit about more about myself and what brought me here. Um, I'm a journalist, so I report for Fast Company Magazine, the UC Berkeley Greater Good Science Center, and a bunch of other places. My book coming out is called Divergent Mind. And um, what brought me to this work is sort of this nexus of uh, personal and professional. So it is such an honor to introduce you to Dr. Joelle Salinas. Thank you for being here. Let's give him a round of applause. So as you all know, uh, Dr. Salinas is the author of Mirror Touch, which is an incredible look at how synesthesia has informed his life both personally and professionally as a physician. He is a neurologist based at the Massachusetts General Hospital. He's the founder of the Salinas Lab. He's an avid traveler and spent time in regions of Asia, which is where I got my start as a reporter, so I feel that kinship. And so, Joel, the first thing I want to ask you is just how relieved did you feel when you first came across this term, synesthesia? Oh, man. That's so... Uh, hi. Yeah. <laughs> so, the term synesthesia, I, you know, I didn't know synesthesia was even a thing, let alone how different my sensory experience was compared to other people. Like I grew up, like many people with synesthesia can relate, you kind of grow up with this sense that there's something like different or odd about you, but you should just chalk it up to being like a really weird kid. Um, and for me, uh, you know, I was always like very particular about the way that I colored my numbers and my letters. So like one had to be yellow, two had to be red, B had to be orange, and like you become this very finicky kid um, that people just kind of have to like roll their eyes around. Um, but it was only until my first year of medical school when this realization happened. So I was uh, on, a, on a medical mission in India, specifically in Gujarat, and we were uh, staying at this compound, and it's just like a, like a regular night, like a lot of the medical students were there, and we were just kind of talking about the health benefits of meditation. And a friend of mine who had a background in neuroscience wanted to like, chime in a conversation and said, oh, did you guys know that there's these people who see sounds and colors and letters and they have an easier time getting into meditative states? And I was just really struck by that comment uh, because in my mind, I, I thought to myself, I already mentioned that. Everybody has that. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and it was like later on that night was when I confronted him and said, you mentioned this thing about people with like letters and colors. Uh, like everybody has that, right? And he kind of looked at me and was like, mm, no. And, and that's what really launched kind of me on this kind of quest of figuring out like what is synesthesia, learning more about the neuroscience around it, learning more about myself in the process, and a lot of other kind of random things happened along the way, but it was really kind of that pivotal moment of like discovering that there was like a term for this thing. Yes, that was the moment. And in your book, I love the way you set up sort of the background of your childhood and all these things that stood out to you that I think so many of us can relate to, but again, we don't have that vocabulary. Yeah. And so I think so many of us can see ourselves in your book, and it's such a kind of like um, very reassuring feeling to see like, wow, there's other people like yeah. us and that there's a word for it. Yeah, absolutely. It's a... Uh... There's so much power around having um, a concept for this experience. I mean, we, if you just think about it, our, our brain is entombed in this dark box 
kind of shut away from the rest of the world, and all we really have to figure out what's outside of that box is our senses. That's feeding into this. And uh, people can't really see what's going on in, in your brain. And so we, like, as we kind of grow up, we assume that either people have the exact same experience, or when we begin to realize there's something different without a word to it, we can develop this sense of alienation. Like, there's something so different with me. And one of the things that, you know, just drives me nuts about this kind of, uh, this, this feeling of alienation that, that comes from it is that we begin to assume that because I'm different, I am not normal. And, be, and not normal gets tied with these other kind of labels that we're taught, as in like, wrong, or less right. And that can lead to a lot of like self alienation, but also actually alienation from other people who kind of consider you so different from themselves. And I think the, the thing that is just most striking is that most of us walk around uh, assuming that uh, that we are we are one hundred percent like the the norm, um, without realizing that we're, we're probably the exception, at least in some way. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And so you know on that same line, when, when someone comes to you and they say, well, what is synesthesia? How do you define it? Like, how do you frame it, generally? Yeah. I kind of try to get a sense, well, I, I try to build the idea up, and it usually depends on where people are at. You know, I, I think uh, it's very important, um, and I, I think part of this is also kind of the mirror test stuff, is what we can talk about afterwards, but kind of meeting people where they're at, where it's most accessible, and so I try to get a sense of people's levels of understanding of the brain to begin with. Um, you know, one of the things that I love that um, Neil deGrasse Tyson kind of mentions about talking about like astrophysics compared to other sciences, he says he's very lucky, is because astrophysics uses terms like black hole and sun and star and space, and they're very accessible terms that we know. But when you talk about the brain, it's like neuron, action potential, synapse. They're just very opaque terms. And so, like where I like to begin is to say, all right, so uh, one. Our brain is made up of brain cells. More brain cells than there are stars that you can see in the sky. And each of those cells is connected usually to another cell through a little extension, almost like an arm. And we can consider it like a wire, because that's how they communicate, sending little electrical signals to each other. And that electricity comes about, kind of like how electricity comes from a battery. Now, synesthesia, the term, you can break it up into two parts, uh, sin and anesthesia. Sin means bringing together, anesthesia means sensation. You might be familiar with anesthesia from like anesthesia, and meaning like no sensation. So sin means bringing the sensations together. And people who have synesthesia have essentially kind of like a mixing of their senses. And uh, one thing that we, uh, would, that people with synesthesia might experience is seeing colors with uh, letters and colors with numbers, or images with sounds, or tastes with textures, uh, and a whole range of different different combinations. Um, and what's really remarkable is that uh, over the last couple of decades, with neuroimaging, with brain scans, we can actually see that people who have synesthesia not only can experience this and relate it, but if you look at their brains, the sense parts of their brain seem to be more connected by this wiring, and also these different senses tend to be more active together. Or at least, one sense becomes active, and then immediately after the other sense becomes active. So they might as well be kind of going at the same time. And about four out of a hundred people have some form of synesthesia. So some examples uh, are uh, Tori Amos, Billy Joel, Stevie Wonder, Pharrell, Lady Gaga, Lord, Skrillex, these are all people who experience synesthesia. And beyond even artists and musicians, you have the physicist Richard Feynman had synesthesia, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, and so, and imagine someone who experiences color with sound, which is a, a common one that you see in musicians. So sound goes into the ear, and the hearing part of the brain becomes active, and then immediately after, just like within a fraction of a fraction of a second, the vision or the color parts of the brain also become active. And so, a sound can be interpreted at the same time as a visual. And what's even like more mind-blowing, I think, is that we are all born with synesthesia. 
uh, and it tends to go around uh, away around age two. Uh, as our brains begin to trim a lot of excess connections in our process we call pruning, kind of like you're pruning your hedge, um, your, your, uh, our brains are losing a lot of these excess connections, and one of the thoughts is that people who have synesthesia have a difference in the way that their brain is pruned where a lot of these connections kind of remain. And so these different connections happen. And another thought is that people with synesthesia just happen to have more active brain cells, and so they're just very chatty with all the areas around their brain, forming lots of weird connections that other people wouldn't normally experience. Totally. That's what I tell people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just say that I have um, a very sensitive nervous system, mm -hmm. and I say that I have very uh, strong and active mirror neurons. Mm. That's what I say. Yeah. Does that work? Yeah, yeah. Well, with the, with the, so with uh, the mirror touch aspect of it, yeah. um, what I like to kind of then describe is, okay, so we have like sound with colors, and we have like the visual stuff that comes with like letters, maybe with that color, but then what about vision and touch? So all of us uh, have what's known as a, a mirroring system in our brains, and basically what happens is that as we see people move or get touched or even experience pain, our vision area is becoming active, but at the same time, the touch parts of our brain, you know, the, the touch part being like, if I were to touch, like, this part of your of your leg, the signal travels through the spinal cord, and goes up, and crosses over, and then it comes to this touch part. So the touch part and the vision part both become active. So it's like we're constantly creating this 3D virtual, ra virtual reality simulation in our brain of other people's experiences without even knowing about it. And it's believed that this is part of kind of the underlying uh, kind of building blocks for things like empathy and understanding other people's thinking and just understanding each other. And uh, for most of us, that experience happens without knowing. It's unconscious. Occasionally, though, that activity in that mirroring system will become so active that it actually crosses the threshold into consciousness. So imagine you're watching like a football game and suddenly something gets tackled. Uh, that oof, that cringe feeling that you get is presumably this kind of mirroring system becomes so active that you experience it as if it were happening to you. But in two out of a hundred people who have mirror touch, this experience is conscious all the time. Um, so this mirroring system is just very, very active, and this has been seen on uh, on MRI looking at the size of the brain. Those brain areas are a little bit larger; they're also more active. And the other part that's really fascinating is that we all have parts of our brain that are involved in helping us tell the difference between our own physical body and the physical body of the people around us. That in people who have mirror touch, those brain areas are smaller and less active. So it's like the boundary between themselves and the people is blurred. Absolutely. And I think that that's one of the things that's uh, drawn so many people here tonight, and what I think people are finding so much resonance with in your book. And I know we talked before about mm -hmm. that you tend to um, draw many therapists for this reason, mm -hmm. right? So I think many people who go into therapy or into the so-called healing professions can relate to a lot of what you describe in the book and, and possess anesthesia themselves. Um, I want to ask if what your take is, like, is this something that parents should be more aware of in, in their children? Um, because it's, you know, like you were describing, if this is an internal reality that many of us are having, and we're, we don't have the awareness to communicate it as, some, as something that is different from what other people possess, you know, what are you seeing around children and citizens? Yeah, that's a that's a fascinating question. The way that I like to think about it is, you know, we in in schools as we all kind of grow up, you know, a part of our education is just literacy, kind of being able to, to read. And I think that that should also include like brain literacy or like science literacy, but having an understanding of like this the, the basic basic kind of parts of the brain and how the brain functions and understanding that there's so many ways the brain can vary. In its, in its presentation. One of the ways that I describe it is the differences that you see in kind of your skin compared to somebody else's skin, are, that, those number of variations is similar to the number of variations that are in the brain. They actually, the brain and the skin actually come from the same embryonic layer. So 
what you see on the skin are often what you see in the brain. Um, so just having a basic understanding that there are these different presentations I think is already like a good place to begin. Knowing the specifics about each individual kind of manifestation I think can be really, uh, can, can just be a lot of information that's hard to retain to expect everybody to kind of know every single aspect of it, but just knowing like, okay, this is different. And now where can I get some in more information about this? And then kind of approaching it in a framework that doesn't what we talked about before, kind of the idea of like pathologizing. So making sure that you're not necessarily using these, uh, these terms that imply disability or something negative or wrong or less right. And so there's a whole spectrum of terms um, that can go from like probably one of the most severe being like disease to uh, kind of a more positive one being like trait. And that all really has to do with kind of what you as the speaker are trying to communicate to other people. Are you trying to communicate that this is something negative or wrong? Or are you trying to communicate this is something positive or neutral or just a difference? I mean, I like to use the term difference because I mean, it's, we're all so different from each other. We all kind of are on this same kind of like vast spectrum of human experience. And so it's important to just think of, you know, difference is normal. Variation is normal. Absolutely. And I mean, that's what the whole neurodiversity movement is about, is like, well, look at this beautiful array of human brain makeups that yeah. we have. And why would, why would our brains be any different than any aspect of, for example, you know, ecosystems where there's a diversity of flowers and fauna required for, for that ecosystem to thrive? And it's the same thing with us mm -hmm. as humans. And I think you're right that, um, you know, the way we frame these things, the way we talk about them, the words we use, goes such a long way in terms of um, taking that pathologizing away and then really empowering people to own these aspects of themselves so that it doesn't become a source of, um, you know, where they're very self-conscious or where they're feeling like this is not an aspect of themselves that they can bring to the world. And once people do make that shift, it's incredible, like yourself. I mean, it was so amazing to read in your book the way you applied it in um, the, the psychiatric um, units that you were working in. Um, can you share a little bit more about that in terms of the, the tools that you've developed along the way for mm -hmm. how you manage your experience as a synesthete when you're treating or working with clients? Yeah, um, so growing up, with this different sensory experience and not knowing that it was different, I just kind of looked around and I was like, all right, everybody else is sucking it up and doing just fine, so I gotta figure this out. Um, and so I developed a lot of my own kind of ways of, of managing it and going into, into medical school and being in hospital environments where these like very, very intense uh, kind of experiences with other people who are suffering and in pain. Uh, part of what I had to do was um, you know, it's like a, it's a long list of things, but I would say one of them was um, understanding how important it was to expose myself to those experiences. Um, so, um, if I saw something that might be upsetting, knowing that this this is a place where I can learn, like the discomfort in, for for me at least, at least how I been like part of my upbringing is like the things that make you uncomfortable, the things that you're scared of, are usually good learning opportunities. And uh, the more I expose myself to those situations, so for example, someone having a cardiac arrest, the less intense it was because I kind of knew kind of what to expect, and I was like, okay, this is the part where this happens. Um, and another aspect of it was trying to figure out. Um, so I think uh, there's like two kind of like a kind of components that can be unpacked in lots of different ways. But I would say attention and regulation kind of really factor into it. And, um, attention, you know, is like the spotlight of your mind, and wherever your spotlight, that spotlight is, is your reality that you're building. There's all the other things outside of the spotlight that you're not aware of that are, are feeding into kind of this experience and where to look. But um, where you kind of put that spotlight can kind of turn down the volume of how vivid things might be. So, and seeing someone, uh, so I'll give you an example. So, um, in my neurology training, I began to see people who had. Uh, lots of neurologic diseases, and some of these, you know, the, the newer or different that they, uh, the more surprising they were, the more vivid they would be, and that kind of actually ties into our like brain stuff that we can go into as well. But um, uh, one of my patients, I distinctly remember, he had developed self-mutilating tics. Um, he, had, he was having a lot of stress, and so what he does is he 
chews on the inside of his mouth, and he takes his knuckle and he pushes it against his mouth and grinds it at the same time, to the point where the side of his mouth can split open like shredded beef. Mm. Um, and so as I'm watching him, I'm feeling on my face, as if I were looking in a mirror, uh, a painful buzzing sensation right over shooting through my cheek into my teeth. It's almost like someone's holding a stun gun and pulling the trigger every time he does that. Um, and in that kind of a situation, I have to kind of, I have to remind myself that you know, this person's here because they're placing their trust in me to help them out. And so I have to really pay attention to their experience and do what I can to help them out. And if it's too intense, I give myself like a moment and I'll focus on my own body, my own physical body, my own sensory information, and remind myself that like, I have my own body. Because part of this mirror touch is my brain automatically classifying everyone I see as if they were me, as if I was their reflection or they're my reflection. And so my brain just tries to extrapolate, basically tries to recreate whatever experience my brain thinks that you're having based off of past experiences. And so uh, as I'm, I'm seeing this person go through their, their tics, I think about the feeling of my toes in my socks, which you might notice are, uh, have brains and uh, signs on them. Yeah. I'll draw my attention to, um, uh, to the inside of my body, another bottom-up experience, or like my heartbeat, um, the feeling of you know, just like my muscles, how tense they are. Um, uh, or, uh, just going from the top down, just like changing my attention altogether, so I might look at uh, something that doesn't have a face, so a collar or a sleeve, or, but one of the things I did specifically in that situation is that I was able to catch myself in a computer monitor, my reflection, and I looked at my own reflection and I had the mirroring experience for my own body, so I was like, okay, this is, this is where we ground. Take a moment, all right. And continue. So that's just some. That's just some of the many things that I learned about. And I talk a lot about them through the book, but it's uh, it's been it's it's been a big learning experience. Because you know the other thing I want to make sure that's clear is that it's not just pain and discomfort. It's also pleasure. It's any any sensation kind of gets filtered through my brain reflexively. So watching people hug is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like it's like you're it's like. You're being hugged, and you're hugging. And you're like this unit of hug, <laughs> or like like seeing like like a baby, like giggling, like playing. Like it just feels to like feel round and like pudgy and it's, it's so great. That's awesome. What about when you see someone swimming? Oh, so the feeling of the the water on my body. I mean, sometimes it's just like a like a big mess of stuff, and wherever my attention is most focused on is what what's there. I mean, that's just like, I basically feel like I'm a wet dog, just like, yeah. <laughs> just like struggling. Like you're taking showers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so let's talk about love for a second. Sure. Because this, this is a huge part of your book. Yeah. Um, and I think you talk about this in your book, So the boundaries is a is an important aspect of it, and then I can, can relate that into kind of love. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the idea of boundaries is really important, and this is for everybody, right? It's a, it's you you know you want to have firm yet thoughtful boundaries, and I'm very deliberate when I say thoughtful because you don't want to put up a wall in a way that creates harm to yourself or other people. Um, and this idea of boundaries is. A lot about just like trying to find your Goldilocks zone of how open you are to the experiences of other people. Um, so, um, if and this relates to kind of this concept of like resilience is how can you kind of process um, this? So, um, empathy. So, empathy, there's, there's different flavors of empathy, there's at least two flavors of empathy one is cognitive or thinking empathy, and the other one is affective or feeling empathy. 
And so, again, empathy is like one of these many concepts that are very complicated, but in terms of how we kind of define it or describe it, the idea of um, cognitive empathy is thinking through the experience of another person, so trying to kind of put yourself in their shoes, kind of going logically through it. Uh, the affective empathy is kind of this, you notice and you recognize the experience of another person, you kind of uh, give it a label in your head, and then there's kind of this feeling part of it. And you have an emotion that's similar to what the other person's having. And now when I say emotion, that's a whole other thing that could be unpacked, but the, uh, the idea would be more closely to be, being kind of a very bodily experience. So your, your bodily experience begins to recreate the bodily experience of the other person. And it's not so much about it being one-to-one -one with the experience of the person, because the only way it be one-to-one -one is if like, you were inside that person's skull. Um, but it's uh, kind of your own, your own brain's estimate based off of your past experience and the context and all this other information. So empathy. Now, uh, we all fit along this whole spectrum of empathy, where we have people who don't have very much of an, empath uh, an empathetic experience with other people, and then you have probably on the polar opposite end is mirror touch, uh, mirror touch sensitivity, people with mirror touch, and there's lots of people who fit higher on the end, who's like therapists and people who are um, very attentive to the experiences of other people, probably fit higher on, on that, and uh, so in the process of of acknowledging, for example, someone in distress resonating with them, you're creating just stress in your own brain. And so that can lead two different paths. So one path is, oh my god, that's painful, that's horrible, look away, go away, don't help. The other path is to take that experience of distress and then say, oh, this is a chance for me to help this person. Um, and that kind of, kind of shift from kind of empathy to having a motivated state of wanting to help somebody else is called compassion. So that's a concept of compassion. And we actually do something nice, it's called kindness. Um, so in um, this experience of kind of like drawing boundaries with other people, you have to figure out like what kind of a reserve do you have to be open to the experience of other people. So another example for myself, when I am like sleep deprived and I'm sick and I'm really stressed out, I have to tell myself like the boundaries have to be up because I can't take on the distress of other people because I don't have these higher order brain functions to move from the distress to, to like really helping them out. Uh, so I have to really recruit that. But if I, if I can and it's needed, then I'm, I'm totally open and, and can kind of manage it. Now in terms of love, uh, so this is where it gets complicated. Um, so with love, so Part of this kind of empathetic experience, this mirror touch experience, comes from two kind of components coming together. One is biology, so like, you know, the hardware of your brain. And the other part of it is how willing you are to experience the experience of another person. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like the, the software. Um, and so when you're with somebody that you are falling in love with, you are very, very willing to take on their experiences. And that's just part of the process. Of, of kind of love or infatuation, kind of like kind of synchronizing with this other person. And for myself as someone who has mirror touch, uh, as I would spend more time with people, especially if I was very willing to kind of be around them, I found that over time, this internal kind of mental map that we all have of our own body, you know, like if you close your eyes, you can say, okay, my right hand is here, my left hand is here, my right foot is here, my nose is there. But for me, over time, that mental model began to merge with the other person. So them not being around almost felt like a limb was missing. And I think this is an experience that many people can actually relate with. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I like the way you kind of walk us through the various aspects of, of what the experience of love is as a sense. You do it beautifully in your job, in your book, and, and thank you so much for sharing so vulnerably. And I think it really allows people to to work with the synesthetic trait inside themselves, right? How how do I approach this and and let it inform me and enrich me in my life, and in my profession, and when are the appropriate times to put up those boundaries, like you were saying? Um, and so I think having the awareness, understanding you know, the scientific research behind it as well, so that we can kind of have all those areas covered, 
you know, kind of makes us just better informed. And on that note, actually, I was curious to hear what what kind of research is happening right now around synesthesia. There's a lot of really, really fascinating research going on. So the history of synesthesia research, to kind of put things into context. So um, kind of like late 19th century, so like late 1800s, uh, kind of some of the first cases of synesthesia, or at least the use of this term synesthesia was being applied. Um, and then over the couple of years after that, slowly that kind of was buried. And part of that was because in kind of science, especially science of the brain, there was a rise of what's called behaviorism. And so in behaviorism, the focus is, uh, what do I see? Because everything else doesn't, doesn't matter. Because I can only measure what I can see. Um, and there was several decades of this behaviorism, and it was only until kind of like the late 1980s, early 1990s with MRIs coming in, and then functional MRIs coming in, that synesthesia began to reemerge. And I would say it was really up until like 1995, like early 2000, where synesthesia really had a, a much more firm amount of evidence around the trend that this is not just a subjective experience, that this also has like a really re kind of reliable neurobiological mechanism that's tied to what we can see on scans. And then that really helped to encourage more scientists to study it more and more and more. Now, uh, mirror touch. Uh, the first case of mirror touch was recorded in 2005. That was like my first year in medical school. Um, and over the last uh, decade, so much has been learned about um, mirror touch uh, from fMRI research looking at the brain areas involved to use of EEGs and other kind of psychometric testing to kind of see how this experience of someone who uh, has mirror touch is very different and there's brain areas that are involved in this as well. And we're still learning more about what, what actually factors into mirror touch, but learning about mirror touch also helps us understand more about everybody else, their experience of experiencing touch and connecting with other people. I mean, one of the fascinating things about just like the touch sense in general, so touch is your very, very first sense to emerge in the womb. And it's the first to mature as well. So like around six months, you can do studies and you actually see the brain reacts to the touch experience. Wow. It's so like the skin is like this like massive organ that we're wrapped in that's from the same kind of like, kind of a primordial kind of fabric that the brain is made out of. And when you're born, you're kind of beginning to learn based off your senses where you begin and others end. Right, and that's when that boundary piece comes in. Exactly, exactly. Okay, well, I want to thank you so much for being here with us, and we're going to open it up to some questions now from the audience. Let's give Joelle a big hand. Mm -hmm.